Thank you very much to attend. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much to, to uh, attend our seminar series. And I'm Du Xin Song, uh, Associate Dean for Research in College of Pharmacy. Today, we're really honored to have uh, Professor Sarah Wonderberg to give a talk today. And uh, Sarah's research fo is focused on um, uh, polypharmacy medication decision-making process, especially for adult older patient. And she just recently published two pieces in a very prestigious journal in JAMA. So you can check that on, on her webpage. And she's really uh, focused on this area for a while and she can really give a good advice, not if on the, for the research uh, scientist, but also for the patient in general. And without further ado, Sarah, thank you very much and to give a presentation. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dushan. Um, so for those of you who I, I don't know, I'm a clinical associate professor here at the University of Michigan College of Pharmacy. And I'm really excited to talk with you today about too many medications, older adults' perspectives on deprescribing. And so during our talk today, feel free to put questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Admittedly, because of how the screens are working, I won't be able to see them until the end, but I will do my best to answer all your questions at the end of the talk. Um, so I'm a pharmacist by training, and I have experience working in a community pharmacy. It's been a while, but I've worked there and done a lot of medication therapy management visits. And then I've also worked in a geriatric transitions of care program in an ambulatory care clinic. And along the way, I've had the opportunity to work with many older adults who are taking multiple medications. And so I thought I'd just share a few examples. And so here, this is an older adult who's taking six prescription medications, um, six over-the-counter medications, as well as four dietary supplements. Um, here's another example. And in this case, the patient was managing a complex medication regimen that included a combination of inhaled products, intranasal products, and oral um, routes of administration. And in this final example, this patient also had a complex medication regimen that involved a mix of once daily medications, a medication that's once a week, injections to use with meals, as well as some as needed medications and a temporary medication for an infection. And so I would like you to take a moment and imagine that you were on one of these complex medication regimens. So you're taking multiple medications. Now imagine you go to the doctor's office and you're after taking these medications for years, your doctor tells you it's time to stop the medication that you thought that you were going to take for the rest of your life. So take a moment and think, how would you feel about this proposed change? So older adults have a variety of feelings about their medications potentially being stopped. Some patients may react really positively. We're gonna decrease how many medications I need to take. We're going to decrease the cost, how much I need to spend on these medications. Some older adults might not have strong preferences. Maybe this is just another medication that I put in my hand in the morning and I take my handful of medications and I don't feel any different if I accidentally skip a dose. It doesn't really matter one way or another, so I don't have a strong preference. And some patients may question, why are you making this decision after I've been on this medication for so long? I've been taking it for 15 years. Why suddenly do I need to stop this medication? Um, should I have stopped it sooner and you just forgot to tell me? Or maybe, are you giving up on me? And is that why you're making this recommendation? You don't even think I need to worry about preventive health medications anymore because of my health status. And so in today's talk, I'll share more about polypharmacy, including why older adults who um, take multiple medications. We'll spend some time talking about why taking multiple medications can cause problems, not that it always does, but it can and why these medications continue to be prescribed. Because it might seem like really obvious. We have medications, we're saying there's too many, just go ahead and stop them. But it's actually not that easy and we see a lot of barriers in practice. We'll spend more of our time talking about decision-making. I'll talk just for a moment about who may be involved in making deprescribing decisions. And then talk a lot more about what matters to older adults when they consider deprescribing. And then in the last part of the talk, I'll talk just a little bit about how we might think about fitting deprescribing into clinical practice 
as well as additional research or policy changes that could improve uptake of deprescribing. And so let's take a minute to talk about polypharmacy. Let's start by just defining the problem. So I would argue that we have a public health issue. Too many older adults are taking too many medications. In fact, up to 50% of older adults take too many medications. And so you might ask, well, why are older adults taking so many medications? It's actually complex. There's a lot of reasons why people take a lot of medications. One of the reasons is that people tend to acquire chronic conditions as they age. More than one in three older adults have four or more chronic conditions. And then studies have found that nearly three in four older adults have two or more chronic conditions. And certainly not all chronic conditions are managed with medications, um, but they are a common part of the treatment plan for many conditions. So I wanna be really clear though, if a person has multiple chronic conditions, they may very well need to take multiple medications. However, it's important to recognize that our bodies change as we age. When a person starts an appropriate medication and they're in their 50s, it doesn't mean that that medication is still the best choice for them 15 or 20 years later. And so with that, let's take a moment to define the term polypharmacy. Um, this is actually somewhat difficult because there's more than 130 definitions of poly polypharmacy published in the literature. Some definitions focus on the number of medications. And the idea behind this is that, you know, the more medications you take, the more active ingredients you're exposed to, the more risk of side effects from these medications, or that the medications will interact with each other or interact the drug interacting with another health condition that you have. Other definitions talk about the level of risk with individual medications. Um, high risk medications are ones where taking them might increase the risk of the person having a side effect or problem from the use of the medication. And so some of you on the clinical side might be familiar with criteria like the Beers criteria or start-stop criteria that help clinicians identify medications that are higher risk, either individually or when used in combination with each other. Um, I also, though, would argue that it's not only prescription medications that matter, although much of the deprescribing research often focuses on prescription medications, but over-the-counter medications and dietary supplements can cause problems too. Older adults who take a lot of ibuprofen, for example, um, might increase the risk of GI bleeding. Use of diphenhydramine or Benadryl to help their insomnia could increase their risk of falls. And so thinking about the medications holistically and not just the prescriptions, I think is important. And if you think back to the, that first example I showed you, I think you could even see there, if we just looked at the prescription medications, it doesn't look so overwhelming. But once we add those over-the-counter medications and dietary supplements, we really start to develop a pretty lengthy list of medications. And so why does too much medication matter? Um, I'll summarize this very uh, briefly to say that studies have identified that too much or unnecessary medications can lead to problems. We can have functional decline, cognitive impairment, falls, adverse drug events, and increased cost, both to the patient, their family, as well as the healthcare system more broadly. So you might think to yourself, okay, so the person's on an unnecessary medication, just stop it. However, as I alluded to earlier, there are barriers to deprescribing in clinical practice. So as a few examples, there's not enough reimbursement for medication reviews. They take a really long time. Um, in addition, patients who need alternative therapies, like instead of taking an anxiety medication that's a high-risk meditation using cognitive behavioral therapy, they may not have access or the ability to pay for that type of service so that they can stop the medication. Um, we know that when you think about information technology, we know that care is fragmented. There's different healthcare systems using technology that's not integrated with each other, and it's creating these information silos that makes it very difficult. For example, if you're a primary care provider and you have a patient who has seen a specialist and the specialist has prescribed a medication and you don't think it's any appropriate anymore, are you going to stop it? Or do you somehow get in contact with the uh, specialist? Or are you referring the patient back to the specialist to have that conversation? There are also barriers for providers. Um, we are asking healthcare professionals to make decisions about complex medication regimens 
in one, a limited amount of time, but two, with limited data and high degrees of clinical uncertainty. We don't have studies saying that, you know, if we stop this medication definitively know what we know what's going to happen. We have general uh, number of studies that say we don't expect uh, patients to have worsening health as a result of stopping me medications, um, but there's still uncertainty. As I think about professional roles and identity, who should be involved in deprescribing decisions? Um, we have pharmacists, we have primary care providers, we have specialists, we have other pro uh, professionals who may be involved in these conversations. You have to wonder where does deprescribing fall in terms of priorities? We know that workload is already high without having time and sense of patients and our deprescribing conversations. Um, I saw a study recently that estimated that a primary care provider would need to spend 27 hours per day to provide all of the guideline recommended care to patients. And yet here I am arguing that we need to do more, right? We need to talk about deprescribing. And so I think this gives an argument for why it's really important to think about what matters to older adults and how do we efficiently have these conversations in practice. And then lastly, I'll touch on social factors. Um, an example of a social factor would be if the patient um, if the, or I should say if the physician, for example, feels pressure by patients to prescribe the medication. And so that leads us into thinking more about patients. Um, Adam, Todd, and colleagues developed this deprescribing rainbow to highlight different factors that influence whether a patient is willing and able to deprescribe medications. And we'll come back to some of these concepts that kind of embedded in the slides that I'm sharing um, forthcoming. So with that, let's transition to talking about decision-making. All right, so take a moment, get comfortable. I am going to share a scenario with you and then ask you to make a decision for a patient. Um, I'll give you a heads up. This is actually a scenario, it's an abbreviated version of a scenario that was uh, part of a study that I'm going to share with you. And so you will get to see the results at the end, but I would like to, to see like what your perspectives are on making a decision. Okay, so like I said, I'm gonna read just a little bit of information to you and then you'll get to, to, we'll do a poll and you'll get to decide. So Mrs. E.F., she's a 76 year old female who has multiple health conditions, including an irregular heartbeat, COPD, which is a breathing problem, constipation, depression, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, a history of blood clots, indigestion, and brittle bones or osteoporosis. She has regularly seen her primary care provider for the past 10 years to help manage her health, and she trusts the doctor. Um, she does have a spouse, but the spouse has been experiencing some worsening health, and it's made it difficult for her to balance caring for her spouse while also doing things like maintaining a healthy diet and exercise choices every day. And so over the years, her doctor has prescribed 11 medications. You can see them on the screen. And she says she takes all of them according to the directions. Um, she uh, Mrs. EF believes that it's a good idea to take medications if they benefit her overall health, even if the benefit is very small. However, she also acknowledges that she doesn't really like to take medications. Um, she also notes that she's had a number of problems like feeling tired, having constipation, and occasionally feeling dizzy. She has talked with her doctor about this in the past, but it's unclear which, if any, of the medications are causing problems. And so today she goes to her doctor's office for a routine visit. And I'm not gonna read the entire conversation to you due to limited time. However, I'll share that um, there's some dialogue where um, the doctor, uh, or, or the, it describes how the patient, Mrs. EF, was prescribed simvastatin, that's a cholesterol lowering medication, years ago to prevent a heart attack or stroke. And she has never experienced these problems. She's never had a heart attack or stroke and all these years have gone by. And so now her doctor raises the idea of stopping the simvastatin because it may not, may not be providing benefit given her age. And so based on all this information I've shared with you, I'm curious, what do you think? How much do you agree or disagree with the following statement? I think that Mrs. EF should follow her PCP's recommendation and stop taking simvastatin. And so I'll give you a moment. Hopefully you can see the poll. I'll give you a moment to vote. Seeing answers come in, so that's exciting. It worked. Look at the about maybe 10 more seconds. I have about half of participants right now.
Uh, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. So last chance to vote. All right, hopefully you can see the results. Um, that many of you were in the five or six range on the more agree side, but some people had uh, opposite opinions. They thought that they disagreed with this recommendation. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing this. Give me a moment to get back to the slides and I will share with you what the participants in the study said. Okay, so as I said, this was an abbreviated scenario that my colleagues and I used to test the impact of the drug. So we actually looked at two drugs, simvastatin or lansoprazole. So every participant got one of the two scenarios and the rationale, and we had three rationales. Either we said it was a lack of benefit, like what I showed you in the, the scenario I presented to you. We had um, a rationale around the potential for harm or a combination of both lack of benefit and potential for harm. And so we randomized the about 5,000 participants who were people 65 years and older in Australia, the Netherlands, UK, and US um, into these different groups. And the last thing I'll say before I move on to the next slide is that participants received the same scenario, except that the drug that was being recommended for discontinuation varied and the reason for stopping the medication varied, but everything else was the same. And so we used a, a six point Likert scale to measure the level of agreement where one was strongly disagree as you saw and six was strongly agree with stopping the medication. And overall, there was high levels of agreement reported with stopping either medication. Um, however, we can see that participants did report higher agreement with stopping lansoprazole, a proton pump inhibitor to treat indigestion than simvastatin. Um, a statin medication that, uh, as we described to them, was designed to prevent a heart attack or stroke. And while we only looked at these two medications, this may indicate that older adults would be more willing to stop a medication to treat a symptom that can be self-monitored compared to preventing future health problems. Like if I stop taking Lanzoprazole, a PPI, I'm going to know pretty soon whether I'm experiencing heartburn or not. If I'm taking simvastatin and then stop taking it, I have no way of knowing what my body's doing other than if I go do like a lipid panel. Um, however, all, we should also note that, of course, there's difference in the degrees of uh, severity of the consequences of stopping these medications, like indigestion I can manage, having a heart attack or stroke, that's really serious. And so there may be perceived um, higher levels of importance with the simvastatin. We subsequently looked at the impact of the country in which the participant resided, rationale and drug. And in this one that I'm showing you, we didn't take covariates into the model. I'll show you that in a moment. And so I won't go into details, but you can see that there were differences for each of the characteristics. And so for example, participants in the US reported higher mean levels of agreement with deprescribing than individuals who were in the Netherlands or the UK. We subsequently used ordered logistic regression to examine factors associated with agreement with stopping the medication using that six point Likert scale. And we included experimental factors, which were like the drug and the rationale. We looked at personality traits, um, participant characteristics, risk perceptions, attitudes towards deprescribing and attitudes towards polypharmacy. Um, and I'll just mention that the team that created the survey, um, which I led, would, included uh, geriatrician, pharmacists, as well as um, like health psychologists. And so they had some more insights into some of these things like the, the personality traits. And so here we can see um, that factors like the potential for harm, that rationale increased agreement with deprescribing. Um, when we did, looked at our uh, unstandardized re regression coefficient, um, there were some personality traits that were associated with increased agreement with deprescribing as well. Um, here, we can see that participants in the UK reported higher levels of agreement with deprescribing compared to participants in the US, but we didn't find differences when we compared other countries to the US. Um, higher health literacy was associated with higher agreement with deprescribing. And we also asked participants later on in the survey if they had personal experience using the type of medication or the therapeutic class of the medication for the scenario they received. So if you got the simvastatin scenario, you were asked, do you currently or have you in the past 
taken a statin medication. And then we listed off examples of statin medications for the four countries. Um, and then same type of thing for proton pump inhibitors. If you got the lansoprazole scenario, we got a question about whether you'd personally use proton pump inhibitors. Um, and so we found that people who had real life previous experience with deeper, uh, or with the medication in the same class as the scenario had higher levels of agreement with deprescribing than people who currently were taking the medication. And so while we didn't collect information about participants' actual experience stopping the medication or like why they stopped, did they have a side effect? Were they just non-adherent? Did they intentionally deprescribe the medication? Um, we do know that they were no longer taking the medication and that they had higher rates of agreement with deprescribing. And then finally, we found that risk perceptions and attitudes towards deprescribing, they did predict agreement with deprescribing or levels of agreement in the, in the, using the Likert scale. For example, individuals who were anxious or worried that their health would worsen in the future without the medication, which we called the affective risk perception, they had de uh, that decreased their agreement with deprescribing, which makes sense. If I think I'm going to get sicker in the future, if I stop this medication, I probably don't want to stop it. And so we subsequently conducted a content analysis of participants in the study. And so to take a step back, when participants read the scenario that I had read, described to you, the first question they received was that question about level of agreement with the deprescribing recommendation on that one to six Likert scale. The very next question was, well, why did you agree or disagree with deprescribing? And so a content analysis seeks to quantify the qualitative data. So essentially they count up the qualitative uh, responses from participants. In this particular study that I'm sharing with you, we included people who reported a score of four, five, or six. So they agreed with deprescribing generally. Um, and we only included participants from Australia, the UK and US because their responses were in English um, and we didn't have the ability to, uh, the resources to translate the responses from individuals in the Netherlands from Dutch to English. In this content analysis, we found that older adults who agreed with the deprescribing recommendation most frequently cited the, the general practitioner or the, the doctor or primary care provider as an important factor in their decision. Then the second most important factor or most common factor, I should say, was the impact of the medication. And so over one half of older adults who agreed with deprescribing felt that the doctor's recommendation was an important consideration. Um, they wrote things like, you can see some example quotes, the doctor knows best. Um, there were quotes like, well, if the doc, why would I see a doctor if I'm not going to follow their recommendation? Like the doctor, like I should follow the recommendation. And this aligns with study, other studies showing that older adults are often willing to just deprescribe medications if recommended by a primary care provider. Um, interestingly, only one third of participants discuss the medication as a reason to agree to deprescribe. Um, and the domain or the codes associated with the medication related domain were the medicines causing problems, the medication has no benefit, or alternatives to the medication can be used. And so this actually aligns with a separate experimental study that I conducted of older adults in the US that I'm not presenting today, but I found that the characteristics and preferences of the older adults, as opposed to medication specific characteristics, predicted patient concern about stopping medications. Um, and the final thing I'll note here is that I think it's very possible that older adults who agreed with the recommendation and thought like that I should follow the doctor's recommendation, they very likely thought that the doctor should be taking into account medication related factors when they're making that recommendation. On this slide, we can see that older adults who received the lanzoprazole scenario, so the proton pump inhibitor, were more likely to report that the medication, uh, the medication theme. Um, in particular, they reported that the medication, there was no benefit twice as often as the people in the simvastatin group, so 20% versus 10%. And they inquired about alternatives nearly twice as often. So about 9.3% 9 9 of the participants who got the lansoprazole scenario brought up the idea of an alternative versus only 5% uh, of the people in the simvastatin group. And so we hypothesized that participants were interested in alternatives 
um, given stopping lansoprazole could cause a noticeable change in their well-being, specifically increased heartburn symptoms, whereas most people um, will not notice if they're stopping a statin medication unless you're going to go do a lipid panel, as I kind of alluded to earlier. And so I'd like to highlight one additional study that we've conducted using the survey data that I've shared so far. And so one of my collaborators, Christy Weir, she's conducted qualitative interviews with older adults and their care partners to explore factors that matter to older adults when they're making deprescribing decisions. And so on the slide, you can see that the patient typology, like the part on the top, um, helps to really demonstrate or draw attention to some of the different attitudes and beliefs that older adults may have when they're entering these deprescribing conversations. Um, and I think this is important because deprescribing uh, interventional research often starts with, you know, people who are willing to participate in the deprescribing study, um, or they're willing to at least consider the idea of reducing or, or stopping a medication. However, in real life, we know that clinicians can face challenges where patients do have preferences um, about stopping a medication or maybe have concerns about it. And so we built on this qualitative work by taking uh, data from the survey that I was sharing with you. Um, we had one question where we asked participants to pick which of these three options most closely aligns with your um, beliefs about medications. And so you can see um, there was attached to medications, would consider deprescribing and defer to others. And they were shown the bulleted items underneath. So for example, with the medication attitudes, um, it said like attached to and highly values medications. And when, so they were all kind of grouped together. So the whole dark blue column, those items were all together. We found that um, about one half of the older adults in our study said that uh, we're in that middle column where uh, we would expect that they would want to engage in patient-centered deprescribing. Um, importantly, though, I, I do want to highlight that the defer to others in the far right column, I think it's probably underrepresented. In the original work that uh, Dr. Weir did, individuals who tended to pick the defer to others, they often had poor health, they were frail, they needed support to manage their medications. Um, and while we measured those items, if you're well enough and able to participate in an online survey on the computer, um, you might not completely fall into that category of, of needing extra support. And so if you were to like look at this in a you know more real world population or maybe not of just community dwelling older adults, I would anticipate that that number in the far right would be higher. Um, so now we are conducting additional research using some additional data to look at factors within the typology that are influencing these overall preferences to stop or continue medications. Um, so we actually, while I'm not presenting it today, we conducted a second survey um, that was based on the, the work that I've already shared with you so far, but it looked at if we just focus in on the statin medication and we have six different contexts where things that are happening around the person, their environment, how does that influence the person's willingness to, to deprescribe the medication? So for example, if the adult daughter wants the medication to be continued, how does that change whether someone agrees or disagrees with deprescribing? What if the specialist started it and the primary care provider raises the idea of stopping it? What if the spouse stopped the, their own statin on purpose under supervision because it, it was determined to no longer provide benefit and they subsequently have a stroke? How does that influence now the patient who's making the decision, their willingness to deprescribe a medication? Um, so we're currently working on, on uh, finalizing that paper. But as part of that um, study, we pulled out these different factors um, to understand, like do a latent class analysis to understand where which parts are most relevant for the decision making. And so as you've seen in the example that I've shared, we often introduce the idea of deprescribing a medication at the point where we're asking the older adult or their family to make a decision about stopping, de-escalating, or continuing the medication. Um, however, Michelle Keller, Mike Steinman, and I have argued that it might be actually helpful to introduce this idea earlier. Could we introduce the idea of deprescribing actually when the medication is first prescribed, instead of waiting to make a decision 
after this person has been taking the medication for years. Because along the way, the messaging they're likely getting is, your medication is important. You should take it. You should be adherent to the medication regimen, which is, which is good. We want patients to take medications when they're needed. But by introducing the idea of deprescribing earlier, we'd argued that there's an opportunity then to discuss the need for ongoing reevaluation of the medication. Um, and we also wonder, we hypothesize that if we can introduce deprescribing concepts early and periodically come back to it, um, so prescribed a new medication and a year later when we check in to see how you're doing on that medication, saying, I'm thinking about whether this medication is still appropriate for you, maybe, having those actions up front, could it actually decrease the amount of time that's needed when we actually talk about deprescribing the medication when that decision needs to be made? I don't know, but I think it's an interesting area. Um, I also though think that more work is needed to understand where these medication reevaluations should happen. Um, are we, should we be doing annual medication reviews? Are pharmacists doing it? What information do they have access to in their, in their work environment? Maybe it's routine office visits and we're dividing the medications up over multiple visits if there's a lot of medications or perhaps annual wellness visits. But as probably many of you know, they are already jam-packed full of other tasks that need to be completed. And so it becomes really difficult to um, think about, you know, presumably if a person is taking a medication and they're having a significant problem, that should be addressed, right? But a lot of things that I'm talking about are, you know, there's no obvious bad thing happening. And therefore it's not going to raise the conversation about deprescribing to the top of the to-do list with the patient. There's probably other um, important things that need to be dealt with, especially if a patient, an older adult does have multiple chronic conditions. And so here is an example of a one-page patient information sheet um, that I had the pleasure of putting together with Jeff Colgren and Preeti Milani. It introduces the idea of polypharmacy and deprescribing. It's available online. You can download it like a one-page document you could print out. Um, I think that this type of information, whether it's this piece or other pieces that have been published by others, I think it could be used early on when you're prescribing a medication even to introduce the idea of now we are starting a medication, let's periodically reassess whether it continues to be needed. Or it could be used later when the deprescribing decision is actually needs to be made. Um, so at this point, you might be wondering, do I only do work in the hypothetical world? Um, no, I, I do some work in the real world too. And But before I get to that, like I want to address, I think, the importance of hypothetical work and the limitations, right? So limitations. I am asking people to imagine being in a situation and make a decision. Um, however, I think that this can be a valuable way to gather information about older adults' attitudes, beliefs, preferences, what matters to them in a really cost-effective and efficient manner. Um, it's really complex to conduct deprescribing interventions in the real world. And so I would suggest that the findings from these type of surveys um, can help to inform the development and implementation of patient-centered deprescribing interventions. And maybe they'll have a higher likelihood of being successful because we have gotten input from so many uh, older adults along the way. I should, I didn't talk about this earlier, but I'll, the final thing I'll highlight about the, the hypothetical work is that in the development of the scenarios, for example, we worked with stakeholder groups that did have older adults in them to make sure they felt realistic and that it aligned with what people might actually be experiencing to try to get the scenarios as close as possible to what a real decision-making conversation might look like. Um, still limitations, but nonetheless, we're, we're tracked. And so now I'm going to transition to talking about two projects that I've worked on in the real world um, that have been informed by the data that I've shared with you. The first is the National Poll on Healthy Aging, and data was collected in January of 2023, so just this past year. You can see if you, if you want to, uh, there's a patient-friendly, uh, layperson-friendly document, the orange one, um, as well as some news articles that were that were shared about it. And so we asked participants, so people 50 to 80 years old, if they had real experiences, so not hypothetical, but real, of stopping a medication in the past two years, stopping a chronic medication in the past two years. 
And we found that 26% of participants reported stopping one or more prescription medications that they had previously taken for over a year. And of those who stopped taking a prescription medication without starting a replacement, 36% of them did so without talking with a healthcare professional. And so I think this demonstrates that there needs to be more medication conversations across the continuum, starting with when a medication is prescribed, adherence and persistence to the treatment regimen, as well as when we're making deprescribing decisions. Now, I will fully acknowledge we did not, like, I'd have no way of knowing from this particular study if it was appropriate if they stopped the medication. So are these all people who should still be taking it? Did they just like on their own realize that I shouldn't be taking it because I'm having side effects? And was it appropriate deprescribing? Um, deprescribing, tends, we tend to think of it as alongside a healthcare professional. So would you want to call this deprescribing? I think there might be some argument there as well. But either way, people are stopping prescription medications without talking with a healthcare professional. And then finally, from this study, I'll note that among older adults in the study who reported taking prescription medications, about 50% of them expected that their healthcare provider was going to review each prescription medication to determine if it was necessary, safe, and working well. Like all of those things were listed in the survey um, at every visit. And 42% expected this to happen at least annually. However, we know that there is not enough time for this level of review to happen during a routine office visit, particularly for older adults with multiple chronic health conditions. So I really think that more work is needed to figure out how to implement patient-centered deprescribing in clinical practice. And so I wanted to build in plenty of time for questions and discussion. And so I'm nearing the end of the talk, but I did wanna spend a, a moment talking about implementation. So I've had the opportunity to work with uh, Donovan Moss on a study, he's a psychiatrist. And the aim of the study is to reduce opioid psychotropic polypharmacy. So um, taking multiple CNS active medications or opioids, so high risk medications, specifically in people living with dementia. And so the objective of the study is to adapt existing patient education and make it appropriate for people living with dementia, as well as engaged care partners to address, once again, people who are taking three or more of these psychotropic or opioid medications. And so when we think about why this matters, like the combination of these medications just in general for older adults can be harmful, but that risk can be even greater among this patient population. And so we have conducted some focus groups um, that Donovan and his team has led and have had the opportunity to collaborate on to understand um, in a brochure what information matters to older adults and how can it be presented in a way that um, activates them to seek a conversation with their healthcare professional, but doesn't cause so much fear that they are, you know, very worried and feeling like, you know, I have to immediately address this or goodness, like we don't want them to stop the medication without talking with a healthcare professional. Um, so we're currently evaluating whether this low touch intervention could prompt individuals to talk with their healthcare professional or the caregiver to help talk with a healthcare professional about these dangerous combination of medications. I personally think it's helpful to be able to draw on the data that I've gathered from these hypothetical or other uh, surveys that I've done to help inform the content of the brochure alongside the focus groups that have been conducted. So I just wanted to give an example of how you can like use this hypothetical work in the real world. world. Um, so as we finish up, I did wanna share a few ideas about future directions. It's not a comprehensive list and I probably have more that I wanna do than time available over the next five years. Um, but just to highlight a few things, I think there's a need to figure out how do we efficiently identify patients who are candidates for deprescribing in routine clinical practice um, and determine if they're interested in, in these conversations. So I've kind of alluded th to this today, but my work really has uh, a focus on medications where it's preference sensitive decision. So like the decision or the preferences of the patient make a difference on whether it's appropriate for them to stop or continue the medication, which is a different situation than you're on a medication. We know it's causing harm. You should stop this medication. It's not ethical for you to continue this medication. It's not like in the best interest of you, the doctor shouldn't, shouldn't continue it. But in these preference sensitive decisions, like how, if we're in routine clinical practice and it's very busy, 
it's probably not the best use of time to have someone um, spending a lot of time trying to convince someone who's resistant to deprescribing to stop the medication, unless there's actually a real need for them to stop the medication. And conversely, if you like, no, if you know right away, like, I don't want to be on medications, the more I can go off, the better. I think why spend all the time talking about the reasons for deprescribing? Um, you know, there's these people in the middle though, they have questions, they need more information, um, like lab values or other information resources, second opinion, et cetera, um, to help them make a decision. So how do we tease out these different groups? Um, I would argue that it would be able to help helpful to be able to measure engagement in deprescribing conversations for preference sensitive decisions that's independent of whether you just like stopped or continued the medication. Um, because if the right answer isn't always just stop the medication. So that shouldn't be our measurement. And then finally, um, like to continue to explore strategies to empower patients to start deprescribing conversations with their healthcare team. And so as I wrap up, would like to thank my trainees who have had the pleasure to mentor lots of PharmD students or people who are interested in the healthcare careers. Um, a special thanks to the USD Prescribing Research Network because they funded uh, two ex international experimental surveys, one of which I talked about in depth and the other one I, I alluded to today, as well as the centers that are listed here. I fear that this list is not comprehensive, but I do want to thank everyone who have, who have had the opportunity to collaborate with both at the University of Michigan and external um, institutions. I feel like for completeness sake, I should have a short conclusion. Um, so with that, I'll just say, I do think that medication should be regularly reassessed to make sure they continue to be necessary. We should elicit older adults' attitudes and beliefs as part of this patient-centered deprescribing process. And finally, I think more research is needed to figure out how do we um, implement deprescribing in clinical practice in a patient-centered way that is actually feasible and not gonna burn out all of our colleagues. And finally, I have to do a little plug because I was excited because um, I got the email like a, an hour ago. Um, I'll just end with a little bit of self-promotion. We did not talk a lot about OTC medications today, but here is a new patient education piece about um, non-prescription heartburn medications that was just published. And really it's designed to help support older adults make decisions about which OTC heartburn medications are appropriate for them. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and I'll see if there's any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Can, thank you, Sarah. Anyone can ask questions. I can enable, you can talk if you raise hand or you can type into the question, your QA session or in the chat. While, while people are waiting, are typing, Sarah, I have a two, two questions maybe. One is 11 medications still are a lot. What, what if I have all the symptoms? I, I'm lipid is higher. I do need this statting. Then what? Should I de-prescribing de also? That's a great question. At the end of the day, I think it really depends on the person, their goals, what their health status is. Like there's no one right answer, which I think is why this area of research is interesting to me. Um, 11 might feel like a lot to you, but I've also worked with patients who take 20 or 25 medications every day. And so I think that our personal experiences influence whether or not a medication is appropriate. Um, but having those conversations with the doctor, as opposed to just independently deciding, oh, I'm going to stop all my medications, I think is helpful. So at the very least, if 11 feels like too much, maybe you can work with a healthcare professional to identify of the medications, which are the most important for me and to help me meet my health goals. And so maybe there is a way to deprescribe. Maybe it's not all of them, but decreasing it in a careful way that's monitored. And by having um, the input of a healthcare professional, whether it's a pharmacist or physician or nurse practitioner or physician assistant, I think we can make sure it's, we're monitoring and making sure the patient's staying healthy after stopping the medication. So not direct answer to your question. But another question is 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 just opposite, maybe opposite. Or so if I go to see a doctor, then I have a lot of medication. Then one medication causes me nausea. Then doctor give me a medication for anti nausea. Then a medication causing the muscle pain. Then I have another medication anti muscle pain. Yeah. How do you avoid the situation? Yeah, so that's a prescribing cascade is the term we'll often use for that, right? Where we have a medication and instead of identifying that the side effect is the issue, we just start another medication. Um, so I think part of it is some education for healthcare professionals to like pause and think, as there, is there a medication that could be causing the swelling in the legs of the patient who, you know, is coming in today with this new symptom? Do they start a new medication that has this as a side effect? 
Um, I think there's the opportunity certainly for, for pharmacists and other healthcare professionals to do things like medication reviews where we're sitting down and looking at each and every medication. It might take an hour or two to go through a, such a comprehensive list though, but that can help us identify, could the medications be causing problems? Um, and then finally, I'll note that it, it, we won't always know, is it this one drug, right? But we could do some testing and trial and error um, if it's if it's appropriate, perhaps to stop a medication, we could try stopping it and see if the symptoms resolve, and if so, use that information to guide next steps. Um, and so, sometimes I think when we talk about deprescribing with patients, instead of just saying, "Oh, we're going to stop the medication," maybe it's let's do a trial of stopping it, see what happens, and assess whether it's okay to keep off of it or go back on it. Um, I see a question in the chat, so I'm just going to read it. Um, so you discuss patients who feel that their doctors know best and therefore take the medication as needed. I'm curious if you've also found that there are patients who stop taking medications, but don't tell their physicians in fear of being seen as uneducated or undisciplined. Yes. So certainly there are patients who, for a variety of reasons, are not checking in and, and talking with the healthcare professional about stopping the medications. And I think you're right. I think some of it comes from the fear of, well, I didn't do what they said to do. And so how are they going to react to this decision that I made? Um, are they going to try to convince me to go back on it, even though I don't want to be taking it? Um, so I think, yes, you're, you're right. That is, that is some of the concern that people have if they are kind of the opposite of the doctor's knows best. Amit has a question also. Uh, okay. Amit's asking, is there a... Oh, this is a really hard question. Okay. This is my boss for those of you who don't know. Okay. Is there a specific therapeutic domain, cardiology, endocrine, et cetera, where we should focus on deprescribing or a rank order of drugs where deprescribing would have the largest impact? There probably is. Admittedly, um, my work really is, uh, I focused it more around broadly speaking, polypharmacy. And so the, the common, the large amounts of medications that people might be taking in combination, as opposed to a specific like therapeutic domain. And I, the reason for that is because I think there's more work being done when we look at specific areas, um, like stopping anxiety, anti-anxiety medications in older adults, um, making sure we're addressing hypoglycemia and people with diabetes by not over-treating with too many medications. So I think there's a lot of work being done there. And so I think that people doing that work could probably comment on this better. Um, but I would also argue that I think there's a need for just general understanding of how older adults are making these decisions that can be applied across disease states as much as possible and not just always working in silos of individual domains. Any other questions? There's one more. One more. Okay. Two more. There might be two more. Okay. Um, how can you address a situation where there's an ethical sensitive decision? For example, when a drug is doing harm, for example, hypoglycemia, or like sulfonylurea or insulin, but a patient is not willing to deprescribe. Whew, that's a fun question. Um, I think there's probably, I'm not an ethicist. I imagine there's more than one right answer. And it's going to depend on a lot of factors, right? Like how, how significant of a problem is this? Is it uh, one that the prescriber needs to say that they could just cannot continue to prescribe it because their license is on the line and this is not a safe course of action. Um, I try not to go down that route. And I think there's more work that can be done around things like motivational interviewing or other behavioral strategies to, to try to meet the patient where they're at and get them closer to wanting to deprescribe. Um, but it's a fine line. We don't want to like push people to make decisions they don't want to make. I think the close, I, I'll give an example. Um, I didn't talk about it today, but I've done qualitative interviews with older adults who've taken benzodiazepines for anxiety or uh, insomnia for, for years. Like my inclusion criteria was if you've taken it for three months or more. And I think all the patients that are participants who enrolled had taken it for five or more years. Um, and while some of them were open to the idea of deprescribing, a number of them, um, for those of you who are familiar with benzodiazepines, they can have some strong effects on people. And, and there's a reason there's a, it's a controlled substance. Um, there were people who said, no, I will absolutely not deprescribe. In fact, I will go find a new doctor before I stop this medication. And so I think there's some limits to how much an individual pro provider pr prescriber can do. Um, 
Do you have any thoughts on how clinical pharmacy seeking to work in clinics with underserved populations can help these deprescribing conversations so that they can understand? Great question. So uh, I'm gonna focus in on so that they can understand. Um, there are a number of resources available, including on the deprescribing.org website. I think there's a video or two to try to describe in patient-friendly terms deprescribing. Um, I think in the long term, the more we can have these conversations sooner, like instead of making it this whole big thing where we have to make a decision, if we can start this conversations when we're first dispensing a medication to the patient to say, hey, I know you're starting this new medication. For now, this is the best medication for you. It might not be forever though. So let's periodically check in and see how it's going and whether you still need it. I think that sounds a lot more relatable than, so today we need to talk about deprescribing decision-making or something like that. Like we wouldn't do that, right? Um, and so I think some of it's the language that we use. Um, I have not really gone down this path, but I think there's some interesting an important work to be done to understand the relationship between, so we prescribe medications. The only patients I end up talking to about deprescribing decisions are those who have been <laughs> adherent to the medication along the way. They, they've been appropriately diagnosed. They got prescribed a medication. They've had access to healthcare professional. They've taken the medication. They're adherent. And now that sometime later we need to deprescribe. And so I think the other piece that stood out from the comment you raised was clinics with underserved populations is how do we like also address these other things so that they can get the right diagnosis and get the medications and have access to them long-term. So that way, well, hopefully we won't have to have too many deprescribing conversations and unnecessarily, but like, so that they're taking the medications. Um, so I think there's some work to be done there to connect those two things. Um, Karen asks, do you think there are policy changes we can make in our Part D program to support deprescribing? Thoughts on this? I think the answer is yes. I, I'm not a policy maker though. I, I'm not sure what they would be at this point. I'm, maybe others have a better idea of how we could adjust the Part D program to support deprescribing. I think at the end of the day, we need, clin we need clinicians who have the right knowledge, information available to them um, and time available, and that's appropriate funding available to support their time to be able to actually sit down and have these patient-centered conversations. What that looks like, I'd love to talk with you more offline about, about what could happen to improve this. Yeah, so uh, comprehensive medication review, review, review reimbursement and, and adding it on there, that may, I mean, yes, that makes sense. Any other questions before we end? If not, thank you. Thanks our, uh, to our speaker again today. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody for attending. Have a good uh, weekend. Thank you.